Although section 1 comes first in the Doctrine and Covenants, it was not the first revelation received by Joseph Smith. It was actually received chronologically between section 67 and 68. So, why was it published at the beginning of the Doctrine and Covenants? Here's the backstory. By November 1831, Joseph Smith had received over 60 revelations from the Lord. Yet copies of the revelations themselves were scarce, and getting your own personal copy was only possible by writing it out by hand. So, at a council with church leaders at the John Johnson home in Hiram, Ohio, Joseph Smith proposed that they print the revelations in book form, which in its first printing would be entitled The Book of Commandments, but would be changed two years later to The Doctrine and Covenants. The council heartily endorsed Joseph's proposal and voted to print 10,000 copies, a number they later reduced to 3,000. Recent convert and experienced printer William W. Phelps would oversee this large printing project in Independence, Missouri, with a printing press he had recently purchased for the church. Eyewitness to the events, William E. McClellan said, A committee was appointed to draft a preface to the Book of Commandments, consisting of myself, Oliver Cowdery, and I think Sidney Rigdon. But when they presented their draft, the conference picked it all to pieces. McClellan said, The conference then requested Joseph to inquire of the Lord about it, and he said that he would if the people would bow in prayer with him. This they did, and Joseph prayed. When they arose, Joseph dictated by the Spirit the preface found in the Book of Doctrine and Covenants while sitting by a window of the room in which the conference was sitting, and Sidney Rigdon wrote it down. Joseph would deliver a few sentences, and Sidney would write them down, then read them aloud, and, if correct, then Joseph would proceed and deliver more. And by this process, the preface was given. The Lord's preface to the Doctrine and Covenants was printed as DNC 1 and placed at the beginning of the book. So that's the backstory. Now let's dive into the Lord's message in his preface. The Lord's message in DNC 1 can be easily outlined with the questions who, what, when, why, wherefore, so that, and hence. By who, we mean who is the intended audience of DNC 1. The answer is found in several verses, which includes here at the beginning where the Lord says it's to the people of my church, the people from afar and on the islands of the sea. The Lord then says his voice is unto all men, and in this case it is a voice of warning unto all people. He says this book is published to all the inhabitants of the earth because the voice of the Lord is unto the ends of the earth. And once again near the end, the Lord reiterates that this is to all the inhabitants of the earth that his message is for all men. So to summarize, the Lord's voice of warning in DNC 1 is to all mankind. Now, the next question is, what is the warning? In answer to this, the Lord is quite straightforward. The people of the earth should fear and tremble because the day is coming when God's wrath will be poured out upon the wicked without measure. His anger is kindled and his sword will fall upon the inhabitants of the earth. The day is coming when those who will not hear the voice of the Lord shall be cut off. So, to summarize, all mankind need to know that God's wrath is coming upon the wicked. The next question is, when will this happen? And the straightforward answer is, this coming wrath will be poured out at the second coming of Jesus. The next question is, why is this going to happen? In other words, what have the people of the world done which qualify them for God's wrath? The Lord says that many have been unbelieving and rebellious. He said they have strayed from mine ordinances, which at this time was best understood as laws or commandments. And they have broken mine everlasting covenant, the Lord says. Now his everlasting covenant is equivalent to the fullness of the gospel, which can be understood as the system of all gospel laws and rituals. We're talking here of such laws as faith in Jesus Christ and repentance of our sins and such rituals as baptism and each of the rituals of the temple. All of this leads, the Lord later says, to the fullness of God's glory. But the people on the earth have broken His everlasting covenant, or made it ineffectual or inaccessible. This happened because so many people don't seek the Lord to establish His righteousness, but every man walks in his own way and after the image of his own God. And their personal gods, the Lord says, are in the likeness of worldly pursuits and shallow pleasures which constitute the walk and talk of so many who are engaging in a form of modern-day idolatry, which the Lord associates with ancient Babylon. And what happened with ancient Babylon is going to happen again. Namely, because of unbelief, 
rebellion, and idolatry, modern Babylon shall fall. So in the first 16 verses, we hear the Lord's warning voice to a people descending headlong into what will surely end in disastrous consequences at His second coming because of their unbelief, rebellion, and idolatry. The next question is, Wherefore, what did the Lord do to help our situation? He said, Wherefore, I the Lord, knowing the calamity which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth, and the coming calamity here is the destruction of modern Babylon just mentioned, knowing the calamity that's coming, the Lord said, I called upon my servant Joseph Smith Jr. and spake unto him from heaven and gave him commandments, which in this context means revelations, and also gave commandments to others, that they should proclaim these things unto the world. So, knowing the future of modern Babylon and those within it, the Lord mercifully gave revelations to Joseph and others and commanded them to warn the world of the coming calamity upon the wicked. But why warn the wicked? So that what might happen? What does God hope to accomplish by inspiring His servants to proclaim these things to the world? Well, if verses 17 and 18 are about what God did, verses 19 through 23 offer five reasons why God did it, each one a desired outcome starting with the word that. The first hoped-for outcome is that man stops trusting the arm of the flesh, or human reason alone, without regard to God's will. The second hoped-for outcome is that every man might speak in the name of God. The third hoped-for outcome is that faith might increase in the earth. The fourth hoped-for outcome is that the everlasting covenant might be established, making it possible for mankind to receive the fullness of God's glory. The fifth hoped-for outcome is that the fullness of Christ's gospel be proclaimed by the weak and simple unto the ends of the world to invite all into the safety of the everlasting covenant. To summarize, because of the coming wrath upon the wicked, the Lord called upon Joseph Smith and gave him and others revelations to go out and warn mankind of the coming calamity and to preach the fullness of His gospel so that faith might increase, the everlasting covenant be established, and everyone on earth be invited into its safety by God's weak and simple servants. Hence, we have these revelations of the DNC. Throughout the Doctrine and Covenants, you'll find revelations that were given to God's weak servants in their language to help them in one way or another understand their errors, the wisdom they sought, the chastening they needed to help them repent, or the knowledge they humbly sought to strengthen them. You'll also find revelations that were given to help Joseph Smith have power to translate the Book of Mormon and to empower his servants to lay the foundation of this church and bring it out of obscurity. In other words, the Doctrine and Covenants is a compilation of revelations to help God's weak servants succeed in this salvific latter-day work. The Lord concludes His preface to the Doctrine and Covenants in verses 34-39 through with a summary, an invitation, and a promise. In verses 34-36, through the Lord repeats that He wants everyone on earth, no matter who they are, to know what's coming, which could be divided into good news and bad news. The bad news is that what's coming is a dismal day of no peace, when the devil will have great power over those who yield to him. But the good news is, that the day is also coming when the Lord will have power over all those who come unto Him. We are to make no mistake about it. When He returns, He will come to both reign in the midst of His saints and to come down in judgment upon the worldly. In verses 37 to 38, the Lord then gives an invitation and promise to all. His invitation is for all to search the revelations of the Doctrine and Covenants because they are true and faithful. It will be worth the time and effort required to do so. And his promise is that all of the prophecies and promises contained herein will be fulfilled. The Lord is emphatic in verse 38 that none of his words in the Doctrine and Covenants will pass away or go unfulfilled. All of them will be fulfilled. And whether you hear of one of my prophecies or promises directly from me, he says, or secondhand from one of my servants, it's still going to happen. This record is true. So by the end of DNC 1, the reader not only knows the grim news of what's coming, when and why, but also understands the Lord's merciful master plan to help mankind avoid that unpleasant outcome. This revelation frames the Lord's entire latter-day work as a time in which Joseph Smith 
and other weak and simple servants have been called by God to urgently prepare the world for the second coming of Jesus Christ by inviting all mankind to come out of modern Babylon and into the safety of the Lord's everlasting covenant. Everyone deserves that chance to choose, the Lord is saying, and the doctrine and covenants can play an important role in helping us make that crucial choice. And that's the story of Doctrine and Covenants 1.